Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, always known as Ford BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review, and today I'll be taking a look at the 1989 Battlefield Robots, specifically the two G.I. Joe Battlefield Robots. There's actually four of them, two G.I. Joes and two Cobras. But I'll not only be taking a look at these two because, well, they're from the same series, but they're actually related to one another, so it makes a bit more, you know, efficient sense to do these both in the same video. However, they were sold separately back in 1989. Now, neither of these make any comic book appearances, at least not in the old mobile comic run of G.I. Joe. And unfortunately, this one, the Tri-Blaster, does not make any cartoon appearances. But this one, the Radar Rat, does. It makes its first appearance in the 1989 five-part miniseries by Deke, Operation Dragonfire in Part 5. First, I'll take a look at the Tri-Blaster. You'll notice that the Tri-Blaster has a slightly deeper shade than the Radar Rat does, and that's because this is slightly discolored. I had actually planned on putting this in some hydrogen peroxide to bring it back to the sort of off-white that the Radar Rat still has, but I figured that this kind of looked more overall like a kind of a desert tan the way it yellowed, so I just kept it that color. The Battlefield robot vehicles are very, very basic. All of them have at least one little gimmick, but the Tri-Blaster really doesn't have any. It's just a very basic looking vehicle, chassis, with some weapons stuck onto it, and that's really all you get here. However, its styling is where it kind of gets sets apart from the rest of the Battlefield robots, because as you can see, this thing has a very uh, rakish angle to it. It has a very narrow front with a front spoiler, making it look like someone had taken an F1 car and just sort of stuck it onto the back of a utility vehicle with weapons. Which is basically what it is, because all of the Battlefield robot vehicles were designed by Guy Cassidy. And while he maybe is better known as a G.I. Joe vehicle designer, he is a classically trained automotive designer. So a lot of the vehicles that he's made during his era at Hasbro actually do tend to have a very sleek look, or they have very automotive stylings to them, like this one. It's armed with a tri-barrel laser cannon, which is where it gets its tri-blaster name from. You can actually uh, spin it around 360 degrees, unless it hits into the uh, next portions here. Mine is a bit wobbly, and I'm not actually going to demonstrate flipping it all the way around. But uh, it's not supposed to elevate or depress. It's, it is only supposed to go around on this pintle here. The cannon itself does have hand grips. So you can simulate an action figure actually firing this thing and steering the vehicle. It just has double, double duty there. And behind that is where the figure sits. It's actually a very narrow hole here and a very deep. But you'll notice that it does have a foot peg. But to be honest, because it's so narrow and deep, I actually find it very hard to line up the action figure's foot with that foot peg. Oh well, doesn't matter. The figure actually does sit in there, and I put sit in quotes, fairly, fairly decently. Here's a 1989 rock and roll, just to give you an idea of how small this vehicle is. It's, um, it's a bit larger than go-kart size, I would say. Now, Rock and Roll did not come with this vehicle. I know he's uh, depicted on the box art on the vehicle, but neither he nor any other figure is actually meant to be sitting in here. Uh, you can just put whoever that you want in there. Like I said, it's very narrow, so you can't really have the figure's like legs go out in any natural direction. He just kind of sits like this, which from most angles actually looks really good. But the fact of the matter is, is that he has his butt sticking out of the craft here. Besides the laser cannon, we do have, of course, this missile rack. The missile rack, of course, kind of spins around as well. I'm, uh, again, I'm not going to spin this thing all the way around, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a bit. But on the missile rack, you get three of these removable missiles. And of course, not only does the missiles on the missile rack move, but the 
antenna also moves along with it because it's just part of the missile rack, really. And on top of all this, of course, it is a rolling vehicle. It has four wheels, which roll fairly well. Although on a hard surface, it does seem a bit strange because the, the wheel treads are actually very aggressive here. And on the bottom, we do have a tiny bit of sculpted detail, which you wouldn't notice otherwise. And they really didn't have to put it in there because it is mostly a hollow vehicle. So just what role did the Tri-Blaster take over from within the G.I. Joe vehicle range? Well, I can think of only one vehicle for that, and that is the 1985 Armadillo, another small, probably highly maneuverable vehicle with a multi-barreled weapon system. But here's where the interesting thing is, is that even back in 1985, this thing would have retailed for more than what this 1989 vehicle would have. And now let's take a look at the Radar Rat, which, just like the Tri-Blaster, has four rolling wheels, which should look familiar, as well as this multi-piece missile rack with three missiles, and of course, the antenna on it, which, again, should look very familiar. But again, I'll get to that in just a moment. For the unique parts of this vehicle, we do have a steering handlebar here, which uh, will actually take off just to take a look at the top. Because not only does this thing have handlebars with a figure to grip, but it also has these extra little arms, perhaps brakes or maybe a clutch mechanism. Well, I don't know, but it's a neat little touch. And of course, that's uh, one of Guy Cassidy's automotive design touches peeking through into the G.I. Joe designs. On top of that, we actually get a seat belt here. This is the standard seat belt, which you saw on a lot of 1988 and 89 vehicles. I think one or two 1990 vehicles. To be quite honest, on a vehicle this small and this kind of cramped, it's really hard to get a figure in there with the uh, seat belt on there. It's just uh, it's a bit of a pain, I I'm not going to lie. But this thing wouldn't be called the Radar Rat if it didn't have a radar dish. And here is where the gimmick of this particular vehicle comes in. Because not only can you have it upright like this, and to be perfectly honest, this thing looks a bit like a moon buggy with the radar dishes just kind of standing up like this. But if you want them out of the way, you can actually fold this whole thing down, which is a kind of a neat touch. But other than that, the radar dish at the top actually does rotate. Again, I'm not going to rotate it all the way around because not only does this have fragility issues, the Tri-Blaster has fragility issues, and quite frankly, every vehicle in the Battlefield robot line has fragility issues. It does have some really nice detail on the top here. Unfortunately, unlike the Tri-Blaster, it has no detail on the bottom, but it is just basically very hollow. Now, I'm going to uh, demonstrate this thing with a figure, just to show you just how really weird this seat is. And again, Back Blast here from 1989 was depicted on the box art for the uh, Tri-Blaster, I'm uh, sorry, the Radar Rat, but of course he didn't come with it. And there he is sitting in here. It's a little bit hard to get his feet into this little tray on the front here. So just what vehicle did the Radar Rat take over from on the G.I. Joe side? Well, my vote is on the 1988 RPV. Another surveillance type vehicle with its big drone. And while the Radar Rat actually did have some armaments, the RPV did not, it at least did have that little detachable radar robot on it as well. But you have to remember that while the RPV may have come out in 1988, it still retailed for more than what the Radar Rat did in 1989. Of course, we do get a slightly bigger, a little bit more complex vehicle, but still, they are sort of basic, very small vehicles with no drivers. So you do get a wonderful amount of value if you bought this back in 1989.
Another interesting cost-cutting measure was the two vehicles sharing a sticker sheet. You notice that this thing has 89 written on the side here, and that actually does mean 1989. It's a nice little Easter egg, although I'm not sure what the M and T was meant to stand for. The Cobra versions actually had the same thing with a little Easter egg sticker. Now you're probably thinking that I was going to compare the G.I. Joe Battlefield robots to something more specific on the Cobra side, but I'm actually going to compare them to the Cobra Battlefield robots here. But they are in no way comparable. I mean, sure, the uh, Tri-Blaster has very sleek stylings, it probably is a very fast vehicle, very maneuverable, and maybe a good opposite number to the Cobra Devastator here, who is very, well, kind of motorcycle-like or ATV-like, but that's also a tracked vehicle versus the Tri-Blaster being a wheeled vehicle. And then there's, well, the Radar Rack, which is in no way comparable to a hovercraft here. So by their function, they're not really that similar. But here's the thing. What actually makes them robots? I mean, it's in the subtitle, Battlefield Robots, but they all have seats and they all have uh, control surfaces for manned operation. Despite the subtitle of Battlefield Robots, there's no definitive mention of anything robot-like in either vehicle's blueprints. I suppose you could read between the lines of the copy on the back of the boxes, but even that is vague. Neither mentions being manned or unmanned. Now, if you're talking about G.I. Joe robots, this is the comparison that you have to make. The Battlefield Robots from 1989 versus the Pack Rats from 1983. Now, of course, the Pack Rats had uh, no way of interacting with the figures via sitting in them and controlling the surfaces, other than these remote controls. Again, unique parts for each of the pack rats. So that's the only way you get interaction between pack rats and an action figure. Like true robots, they're meant to be programmable and you just let them loose. Whereas these things, I'm not really sure how you get robots out of these things. In the early 90s, the UK and Europe release of the Radar Rat dropped the Battlefield Robot subseries designation on the box, but the catalog does mention it. However, I couldn't find any evidence of the Tri Blaster being released over there, but I could be wrong. The Radar Rat also had different colors. The body was light gray and the wheels were blue, but the green part seemed to be the same as the North American release. In the early 2000s, both the Tri Blaster and the Radar Rat were released in India under the Fun School brand. They had a unique Battlefield Robot logo, as all subseries actually should, and came in unique colors. The bodies were yellow, the small parts were a dark green, and the wheels were black. If looking for a Tri Blaster or a Radar Rat or both on the aftermarket, I can't emphasize enough how fragile the green portions of these vehicles are. They're just, just ridiculously fragile. Now, of course, they also have things that you have to look out for, like antennas. Like any G.I. Joe vehicle with antennas, they just seem to disappear on you or break in half. But of course, there's also things that you have to look out for, especially even in photos. It's really hard to know that the top portion of this radar dish actually is meant to swivel on the arm. So you have to look out for the mushroom peg and see whether that's broken or not. It kind of makes me want to get a few more of these in broken condition and send them to Toy Poloi and see what he could do to fix these things up or improve on them. But despite their fragility and of course their rareness because of it, they're still not very popular with collectors. They're just that, I guess, forgettable, I suppose. And that's rather unfortunate, but honestly, it actually has kept the aftermarket value down. You can't actually find these um, fairly easily and for a fairly cheap price, even when you can find them complete with all their parts and not broken or re-glued. But still, I would only really recommend these things for either a G.I. Joe collector completionist or someone who actually had these as a kid and wants them back in their collection.
It also had that um, little radar wrap, something more specific on the opposite. Back in 1983, these were individually. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.